tell my audience a little bit about yourself? Well, my name's Per Wickstrom, and I spent a lot of years as a cocaine addict and an alcoholic. I had been in and out of different rehabilitation centers all my life. And about the last rehabilitation center I went to, it actually was called Narconon. It actually offered a different philosophy and a way to look at life and not a non-responsibility part of life. So it actually gave me uh, a leg up on the situation of rehab. So in 2000, I decided that I was going to open a rehab up. So what I did was, is I bought a building and I hired a staff and opened a rehab. And I was very successful, but I found that the rehab didn't fix all people. And when you can't fix everybody, when we have a universal problem on planet Earth, it's called drug addiction and alcohol addiction, what are you going to do? You're going to have to design something that works that's similar. So I designed a program based on different treatment modalities, different approaches under one roof with the same basic core that I learned at uh, the Narconon Rehab Center. Now, was this from just from your experience, or like, did you like go to school to learn this? Like, how did you come up with these approaches? Well, it was actually from my experience in rehabilitation. Um, I had I had went to four different rehabilitation centers, and I had tried church, I had tried AA, I had tried NA, I had even tried some aversion therapy. Now, how did you start using when, as a as a teenager, or like? I actually used my first drink when I was 10 years old. I tasted some homemade wine with my grandfather. And it was the first time I got a little bit of a, you know, a glow. It wasn't say I was drunk, but I felt different. So as I got older, I used that as a crutch. You know, when you had a problem, your girlfriend broke up you with you, or you didn't make the debate team. So you started off abusing alcohol. Right. Alcohol, marijuana, and the gateway like, drugs. And it was to escape pressure, like from, from school, sports, not being number one on the basketball team, things like that. The same thing our, our children today are faced and with. And when, when did it kind of like stop just from like escaping and more into like a serious problem? Well, in in the 1987, I actually tried crack cocaine, and that's where it actually became more of a job instead of, you know, like what I thought was fun. And as, as life went on, life revolved around crack cocaine. My body actually got addicted to the drug. It wanted more cocaine. My mind wanted more cocaine. So every minute of the day was... Now, did you have a good job playing it that way? Or did you start yeah. doing crime? Or? No, no, actually I had a pretty good job. I maintained, I was a, a, a working addict. I maintained a job. And you were able to hide it? You yeah, I was able to hide it. it. I was in the car business, but I wasn't really able to hide it because you know when I didn't show up for work, what I was doing. But I was so good in the car business that people allowed me to do it and keep my job. So they kind of enabled you? It's just like we enable our children. Who gets them their cell phone? Who buys them their apartment? Who gives them money? Who let them use their credit card? Mom and dad, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives. We're worse than the addicts because we enable the addicts to keep going and going and going because we care about them. We love them. We don't want them to die. We want them to be successful, but they just never do. Because once you get the drug in your body, once you get the taste, and once it becomes that you want to really be high and don't want to confront life, what are you going to do? You're going to continuously get high. Now, did you have a family back then when you started using the crack? Or? Yes, I did. I come from a, uh, my dad was a Chevrolet dealer. Come from a, a upper middle class family. Um, you know, I'd say, you know. My, what kind of impact did that drug use have on, on your family? And well, you know, everybody was hurt. Everybody, you know, didn't like it. You know, some of my family disowned me. My dad said, you know, we just need to, you just need to drink beer and, uh, you know, and that will be fine. You know, but no one had the solution. Everybody just kind of like brushed it off a little bit. You know, kind of like you just kept on using. Yeah, you, 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 you kind of hide it. You 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 push it off to the side because you don't want to look at your son as a as a cocaine addict. If if you had a son, he was doing cocaine, you wouldn't want to tell Joe down the road, "Hey, my son's a cocaine addict." No, my son's doing real well. You know, he's down in Florida selling cars. He's doing great. So, what was rock bottom for you? I don't know if I ever hit rock bottom. What, what actually happened was 
is I finally got a long look at life. And, you know, I really didn't have anything. I didn't have a relationship. I didn't have really any possessions that were worth, really worth anything. And I didn't have peace in my, in my own heart. You know, I felt that until I got cleaned up and felt good about myself, that I, life was just, you know, like a revolving door. Go out, get high, come home, get better. Go out and get high, come home, get better. And I finally, uh, after going, I, was, I had pancreatitis. I went in the hospital three times with pancreatitis and it didn't stop me from drinking. Finally, I hit the spot where I said, you know what, I'm gonna try this sobriety thing. And that's when I went to rehab for the fifth time. But why did it finally work for the fifth time as opposed to the first four times? The, the mean, difference. You actually stayed sober. You've been sober since like 2000, 2001. Yeah, well, actually, actually, I've been sober. I graduated rehab January 13th of 2000. So I've been sober going on 13 years. Uh, next year will be 13 years. Actually, um, what worked was the philosophy was different. What I studied was different. I did not study. I did not study anything to do with I'm powerless and I have to place something in a higher power. What I studied was something that taught me that pair, you can whip this thing. You're responsible for your own condition in your life. Pull your own bootstraps up and let's get on with the show. I learned different life skills that enabled me to be able to handle life. I learned like how to, how to handle certain dangerous conditions, formulas for success. I learned things like how to confront a situation, how to learn what to, to communicate about it. Because, you know, when, when you can't communicate about something, how can you fix it? Right, it builds you know? up and you start to hide it. You have to hide it. That's what your, your children are doing, or your wife and spouse is doing, or your dad and mom are doing. If they don't communicate with you, something's wrong. Because Anytime you've ever seen something wrong, it's because something somebody hasn't said anything about it. They're trying to hide it. So now, when did you open up your first rehab clinic? Uh, uh, actually, the I bought the first rehab clinic in 2001, and I actually re had to redo the building. It was a 60,000 square foot building in Battle Creek, Michigan, and I opened it up in uh, February 13th of 2003. That was the first grand opening that we actually. And you're going to train people. With your point of view and your philosophy, yes, we we train we train people the the way that you get somebody off drugs, the way that the person handles it after drugs, you know, with the life skills and the aftercare. They're all different than than most traditional methodologies. Even though I'm not saying anything bad about you know, they work for millions of people. They just didn't work for me. You know, not everybody is me. Some people get that. So you bet you have, so how many rehab clinics are you in there? Um, well, actually, we just purchased our fourth. We have four rehab clinics, and we have one detox center. And one thing in our rehab clinics that I want to make sure you know is we don't involve any drug usage. We don't give you a Zoloft or Wellbutrin or a Xanax to get off a drug. So you're more holistic? We're completely holistic. We use vitamins, minerals, and amino acids, the building blocks of life. And we also have a personal trainer to work out your body, get you thinking right, and feeling good about yourself. Because you know, you know as well as I do, when you get those endorphins rolling, you feel well, better. I went for like a bike ride around Manhattan today. Yeah, yeah, and you felt great. Yeah, right. and you know, it's it's funny because people forget that, and they they get locked in their their room watching the idiot box instead of like going out for a walk. Now, do you get criticized from people in the pharmaceutical industry and other doctors? You know, I've, I've never been criticized from people in the pharmaceutical industry personally, but there's, there of course have been attacks. You know, when you're drug, when you're using no drugs to get people I'm off sorry, of drugs. That's so counter to what like the doc, so many right. doctors are promoting right now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, the, uh, not the answer, but either is mental health. Has mental health fixed the addiction problem? No. It's just put labels on people so they could get more drugs. So if you're looking to empower people, right? So you've had success, you have, this is your fourth one opening up. Right. So We've, had, we've actually had great success. We've, uh, in the new rehab program, Best Drug Rehabilitation, we actually have 
Uh, now, like, do people come for 30 days, or is, is, does it vary depending on what level they fall into? It, it, it varies on the individual's ability to do the program. If you base a program on a time limit, and let's say you're, you're not finished, and 28 days later, the head guy comes up and says, you gotta go, you have to leave. Well, what are you gonna do? You're not ready to go, but your money's used up, your time's used up, you have to get out of the rehab program, you have to leave. What we do is we base it on a result. Each and every part of the program, it has a series of goals you wanna achieve. When you've reached series one, you go to series two. When you've reached, got all those series done, then you go to the next part of the program. Well, so, let's talk a little about those goals. That sounds very interesting. Well, the first part of the program deals mainly with the body. So we have to get the body healthy. Because if you feel bad in your body, you're not going to be able to sit down and look at issues, handle underlying things. You're not going to be able to talk to your counselor or, or you know, talk to anybody about what's going on until the body feels good. So the first thing, of course, and I said this before, is the vitamins, minerals, and amino acids. We get the body healthy. Physical fitness, running, boxing, treadmills, you know, weight training. Yeah, like that or? yeah we, have an Olymp we have an Olympic train. She used to train Olympic weightlifters as our nutritionist. Her name, actually name is Kim Ford. She's great. So we get your body healthy. Well, after your body healthy, what do we got to work on? We better work on the mind. So we actually start, you know, your counseling sessions. We actually start your course room work. We go into the life skills work. We get you doing those confront control and communication drills. We get you those skills going on. Well, we get that going. Well, the next thing you have to do is you better find some spiritual awareness. So instead of throwing you in a Christian church or a Catholic church or, or a, a, a Buddhist monk, Buddhist, uh, you know, we, we have it all. You can come in and you can study in study groups, your own spirituality. Kind of like choose what you want or it's, what you're it, comfortable with? Or yeah, what it's you what you're comfortable with, with. yeah. Because you might have been raised as a Catholic, but you might believe in Buddhism. And your parents force Catholicism on you and it doesn't work for you. You know, that could be one of your issues, you never know. So what we do is we allow you to explore what works for you in that area. Now the program's the program, you don't you change that. The program is based on, on good, sound life skills, good sound confront control and communication. The rest of the program that you do is based on your own spiritual beliefs so you can get more study. Maybe you want to check out Native American, you know, medicine indigenous. Deal, okay. Yeah, the medicine, yeah, the four corners, you know, maybe you want to do that. We offer that also as it's like kind of a, like an elective. It's not a mandatory thing. There are some people that are agnostic. They don't believe in God. Well, we have to find something for them, so what we do with them is we have things like Muay Thai and Kung Fu, so they can find some spirituality that way. So get out of themselves. Like right, extrovert a little bit, be a little bit more, not just Joe. You know, it's not just Joe the body. You know, we all know we have Joe the body, but it's Joe, and he has to find another game for Joe to play, because drugs and alcohol didn't work for Joe. So then after that, there's the uh, third step, like, well, yeah, the third step is the spirituality. Oh, okay. Then after that, basically what you go into, of course, is more, of course more life skills. You know, you might need some marriage work. We, you know, success, you know, how to have a successful marriage. You might need some more counseling. You might need some good one-on-one. -on -one. You know, you might need some, some honesty, personal values and integrity. You might need all these courses that are the life skill courses to get you the ability to be able to stay off the drugs and enjoy life. So how do you know when someone's ready to leave or how do they know? After they've passed all three of those, those phases, basically the three phases, the fourth thing we do is what we call aftercare. We actually bring the, the client in, okay? He comes downstairs, we have an aftercare specialist, and he has different materials that he can choose that he wants to continue his, his program because when does recovery really start? When you walk out the door. It's no, easy to be sober when you're under, you know, the four walls that you're in. But the minute you walk out, guess what? Life is really there. The drug dealer's there. The old girlfriend you used to get high was the there. Too, right? right. The the bills. The bills didn't go away because you left for two or three months. The bills are still there. 
So what we do is we make a, a six month plan for the individual. We call it an administration scale where the, administra the, the, the person actually designs what he's gonna do in aftercare. He writes it up, he makes the phone calls, we set the appointments up with the counselors, with the churches that he's gonna go do. If he's gonna do, go to AA meetings, we have that, we set that up. If he's gonna go to a boxing club, we set that up. If he's gonna go see a therapist, we set that so up. a lot of follow-ups, not just like throwing them out the door. Like right, we have set it up in advance. Then our aftercare specialist actually puts him on the phone. Let's say he is Catholic and he wants to deal with his priest. We get the priest on the phone before he leaves the facility because what's going to work for him? It's going to be people that are going to help him or her maintain some friendship so they can be sober. Now, do you think that's a big part of your success with these patients? It is. It is. It's, def it's definitely one of the key components to rehabilitation. A lot of rehabs do a lot of good, but when it comes to allowing the guy to leave and keeping close track of the individual, that's when it really matters. When we can really communicate with the individual on a one-on-one -on -one basis, on the phone, we can communicate with his spouse or his mom or his dad, and we can make decisions based on what's best for him, and he might be 200 miles away. And as long as we catch it quick, the individual gets back on a plane or a bus or gets in the car and comes back, and he restudies what he missed. He goes back into those life skill courses and finds out what's wrong. You know, what, what didn't I do? Well, you know what, you didn't go to the, you know, to the counselor. Well, you know, you didn't go to see your, your, your minister. No, you didn't go to any AA meetings. No, you just went home and sat in your college, you know, because actually going home, getting back into the game of life, getting a job, having a relationship are really the important aspects of rehabilitation. Do you think that's what makes you kind of unique? Like having that follow-up care and then making, placing them back in the society? Yes, that and being based on a result and not being told you're powerless. And of course being drug free and you know, and, and life skills. That's not how you met Steve's daughter? Like, a Actually, I, I met Steve's daughter. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, you were, you were asking me about Steve Marchette's daughter. I, who better to answer it than Steve Marchette himself? Um, Steve came to me uh, about three months ago and we talked about his daughter over the phone. And I, I told him right then and there, I said, not only does she need to get into rehab, but she needs to find some goals. She needs to find some purpose. And that's what we really do, is we help instill purpose back into the help individual. Help find their purpose. That's help behind the purpose. And, and you know that you've seen the change in Margo. She's got back, she's got back breath. What drugs do, and I, I don't care what anyone tells you, we're a society based on drugs. So what we do is we create a society to figure out how much money we can make. Because, you know, and I'm no tea toddler, but drinking, that's a drug. You know, Hillary Clinton drinking down there on your dime with her three girlfriends yesterday, down in Columbia, that's drugs. Smoking a cigarette, what could be worse than sitting and becoming a monkey, sitting there like this, putting it in and out of your mouth? caffeine with the coffee? <laughs> By the way, Starbucks? What, what is that? Oh, that's right, we're socializing. And instead of sitting there saying, these are good drugs, these are bad drugs, we need to end the war on drugs immediately, and we need to have a war on ignorance. We need to educate people to tell them the truth. We need to stop these pharmaceutical companies telling you, you can't do coke. Then what the hell are you selling Ritalin for? And by the way, why are you giving it to our youth? And I really have problems. And I'm blessed that I met this guy because my daughter kept playing Ring Around the Rosie, Go to a New health center in LA and then you get out in 28 days you get one full moon you know and what happens when you get out you You're go right, in, right back at it yeah you go into <laughs> AA and they sit there excuse me no one wants to be in AA so what do you do you go to AA and you all sit there and you figure out the new drugs you could do your dealer's sitting in that room everyone's waiting to get out of there you can't mandate you can't by fiat tell someone you ain't doing drugs anymore how do you find out about this program through bread, our mutual friend. But what his program, his program teaches you, you want to get healthy moron, here's how you do it. So you're more on in living than in non-living form. What drugs do is they make you a well, It's very interesting that, that his program doesn't use any drugs. We're talking before like about the more holistic approach. He does two drugs, and everyone needs to hear this. 
He does air and he does water and he teaches you how to move it. Because if you balance air and water, the tie, your body is your birthday suit. It's your temple. And no one teaches you, you know, I'm going back to the Highways of Man, even though it's a different segment. In that book, I tell you, a temple was a place to rehabilitate and educate. And they taught you how to move the water and the air in your body. Your body is a birthday suit that's your attire. You need to balance your body. You cannot balance your body taking your new pharmaceutical pill. You're going to leave 98.6 and go to 101. And what are you going to become, a super hit to repeat? They want repeat customers. They sit and they kill you, but they do it slowly so they make money out of you. My grandmother died of Alzheimer's disease. American food created that. I'm looking at you people. Seriously, my mom died of Parkinson's. Where'd Parkinson's come from? Monsanto, you know, yeah. it's- Man-created man disease. Yeah, all man-made diseases. Because we, we don't understand that our creator, whoever our creator was, and we were created, we were created to co-create, but the creator said, this is it, here's heaven, enjoy what I created for you, eat what I gave you, live within the means, and go become all you can become. There's two things, you go to these idiot schools and they tell you the fastest thing in the world is life. No, it's not. The fastest thing in life, faster than life, is thought. Thought creates life. And thought, if it's in love, we can create so much in love. And they tell you the most powerful thing is nuclear energy, they're lying to you. The most powerful thing known to man is man. I was enabling you. I, I, so anyway, we went out of there and my daughter goes back to see him. <laughs> the didn't give him any drugs. No, they wouldn't even let her in the office. Right. You, you, if it, you want to ask Margo a good story, but it's a horrible story. If you call up Dr. Durant and tell him you got a bad back, He'll give you whatever drug you want. And it's not just Dr. Durant. No, it's a lot no, of it's no, Dr. It's, Durant. It's, it's, it's Dr. The Joe, plug. Jim. And, oh. and, and you know what? They're, they really believe that they're helping. But instead of helping a guy with a bad back, why would you give him a painkiller? Why wouldn't you get, send him to an acupuncturist, send him to a, a chiropractor, send him to a masseuse? Get him physically fit, get the body back with it. Your body will heal itself. It's a temple, like Steve said. Why would you give him pills? Because why? Because it's big business and there's a lot of money involved. And you know what? Until we get the, the medical doctors and the psychiatrists to quit prescribing pain medications and anti-anxiety medications for every disorder from coffee disorder to depression, you're gonna have drug addiction rampant in this country. Big, people, big. people, can't deal with life, so what do you do? Same thing when you have a cold. You want to get better, don't you? So you take cold medication. Well, you actually believe, because these doctors study out of these big books, that they know what's going on, so they give you a pill. That pill doesn't fix you. Well, what do you do? You go back out and get high again, because you feel better. And this is what it is. It's a vicious circle. It goes around and around and around until you're a drug addict, your body's addicted to opiates, and then you got to call bestdrugrehabilitation.com and talk to me. And he will help walk you into the truth. Well, well it's what? interesting. I know, like, uh, doctors only spend like two hours in their whole medical training on vitamins. <laughs> no, people don't even know that. Obama, our president, has he's yeah. trying. Obama's trying to stop you from using natural right. vitamins. It's yeah. not, until the FDA proves it. Follow this. I'm now the FDA. Here we are, two white robe drug dealers. We're testing animals. So we watch. The animal can still make duty. The animal can still leak. The animal still eats. And it will go to sleep. So it's approved. But no one could look at the animal and go, how high are you? Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, are you feeling okay? They don't tell you that the thing roll over what like this and died two hours later. Oh, it's been approved. It, they lie to you. They lie to you. It's got to stop. And his type of program deals with truth. He, there's no love there in, in the sheltering form. There's real love. Look at yourself. Here you are. This is and who you, can you see that really your daughter is uh, recovered. Yeah, I mean, what I was telling you about Barrett earlier, going to, you know, when we went on the road, for the first time ever, my daughter said she would go to camping with me. Ah, there you go. First time ever. 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 And, and we're going to go to the Upper he Peninsula. He is above 50 years old. First time out. I thought he wasn't there over 40. <laughs>
I took it. I took her on some weird trips, and uh, all she did was it was crazy. Like for my 50th birthday, we're in the Grand Tetons. I got thrown out of that hotel too because she's doing crack, and I'm so stupid. I don't know what crack is. My clients did plenty of it, but I never indulged. The United States created crack. We created that. The CIA did, and they gave you a code word, crack. That means don't do it. You know. And these, like they tell you these aren't true stories, but they are true. Timothy Leary was a CIA operative. He got hooked on his own medicine. You know, acid, and who created acid? Some weird scientist called the CIA. That's where it came from. When I was a boy, where did this rope, uh, the sopers come from in the quaaludes? It was 714. Why were the quaaludes called 714? It was a code, don't do it. What is 714? At that time, it was the most home runs hit by any baseball player. Babe Ruth, what are the odds that they would pick that? They picked the stuff so you don't do it. Why would you take acid? You know acid burns you. you know, Why would you call it acid yeah. and take yeah. it? They're warning you, <laughs> don't go there. So, um, great, why don't we just wrap up a little bit? Like, okay. it's been, like a really fantastic interview. Like, yeah. so, final thoughts? Well, final thoughts is, is in addiction, we have a lot of drug programs out there that actually help. Okay, any, I, I'm never saying anything bad about anybody that's trying to help. What I'm saying is that there's a better way to skin the cat. There's a better way to fry the egg. And that way is to give a person a fighting chance to find what really works for them instead of trying to pound that square peg in the round hole and then throwing the person out in 28 days and saying you're fixed. And that's what we do. We find the round peg to go in the round hole that works for the individual with some basic good life skills, good life skill courses, and some good confront control and communication skills so the person can get better and that works. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And the, just one last word. Oh. What he teaches is really true. The word is if you give away power to someone else, you don't deserve anything. Don't listen to anyone else. It's you. You're the answer.